Welcome, everyone. Uh, thanks, everyone, for showing up uh, in, uh, late in the afternoon after many other things at a time of, of quite uh, uh, um, great emotions for everyone on many dimensions. Um, my name is Jochai Benkler. I teach here. I'm co-director of uh, the Berkman Klein Center and a co-author of this book uh, that we are uh, uh, presenting uh, uh, here today. Uh, what we'll do is my co-authors, Rob Farris, who's research director at Berkman Klein and has been a colleague and co-author on reports for a decade and, and on Media Cloud uh, for five or six years now, uh, and Hal Roberts, who, has, who is a fellow at Berkman Klein and uh, has been the tech de lead on building this amazing research platform, Media Cloud, on which we built our research, um, uh, will speak each for a handful of minutes, uh, giving you the general outline. Then we're enormously uh, grateful and fortunate uh, to have uh, two uh, people come and speak with us. Uh, Martha Minow, who is a 300th anniversary professor uh, uh, at Harvard University, which is pretty much the uh, university professor. You're making a face at me, Martha. I shouldn't say it. It's pretty much the fanciest thing this university can say of a person. Uh, with enormous experience, former dean of the law school, uh, who brings both real uh, experience from not only as a researcher, but as a member of the board of foundations that have been working uh, on this for CBS, looking at it on the business side, and who's been working very much on understanding the relationship between what we describe here and the overall media ecosystem and the structure of media and news more generally. Claire Wardell, who is a uh, research fellow at, Short at the Shortenstein Center at Harvard Kennedy School and executive director of First Draft, one of the leading organizations in this field working to understand what's going on, working to train journalists about how to deal with these questions. And both of them have been enormously generous with their time to come and spend time and talk with us about this uh, um, set of findings. Uh, and about their own perspectives on uh, what Claire called information disorder uh, um, uh, and, and the um, uh, questions we need to deal with. So let's start from there. Hal, would you start us? So the idea of this book um, was to wrestle, uh, really starting just after the election, even though the work started far before that, <laughs> with uh, what just happened, what the heck just happened in our country, to our media system, to our democracy. Uh, how did we end up in this, uh, what we call in the book, epistemic crisis, uh, where nobody knows what truth is, nobody actually knows what fake is, uh, and where we're in a world where 46% of Trump voters uh, believe that Pete, say to a survey that they believe that Pizzagate it has some truth to it. And we, not only does that seem crazy, but we don't even know what that survey means when 46% of voters say that. Uh, this leads pretty quickly in post present, post or during the Trump presidency into this world where 51% of Republicans again say that they believe that the press is the enemy of the people. So the press uh, is one of our main institutions of truth in our uh, civic system. Um, and this is obviously problematic. But also, we just don't even know what that means or how we have a civic sphere when our main institutions of the civic sphere don't work for uh, at least a quarter of our population. So uh, what we tried to do initially in the book is to try to f work out who the different actors in this world were. What are the things that we can blame on, on having gotten here? Uh, and a lot of these are the sort of, a lot of these got a lot of attention right after the election. So uh, Facebook micro-targeting, the Cambridge Analytica, Russian hackers, clickbait fake news, uh, all of these online echo chambers, all of these actually got a lot of press. If you look at the data, they got a lot of press right after the election. This is what happened. It's the Russian hackers. They destroyed our system. Uh, but then also there are some bigger, longer term, more political and institutional uh, causes that we consider like the right wing media system that's been, you know, inculcating since at least the 90s and, and arguably since the 50s. Uh, mainstream media itself and Trump himself as a sort of um, a sui generis personality. Uh, 
one of the ways that we consider this is by marketing this on axes of political versus commercial, institutional versus technological. One of the things you notice is that a lot of these sort of fancy explanations like Facebook uh, and Russia are in the technological and commercial uh, um, corner of this chart. Uh, and one of the things that means is they're easy to blame. It's easy to say, oh, it's Zuckerberg, it's his fault, or it's the scary Russian hacker. It's harder to say both as a society and as neutral academics uh, that it's actually the right-wing media. Um, I don't know why this is blue, but I'm just going to keep going. All things have been plugged. All right, we're going to be blue for a while. So, uh, so how do we answer these questions? So, uh, so luckily, we have a big, giant media uh, uh, data analysis platform called Media Cloud. Uh, we collect a whole bunch of data. We've been collecting data for almost 10 years now. For this particular bit of work, we collected about 4 million stories, both from the election period and post-election story period. Uh, those are generally online stories about the election. Uh, and then we combine that with other data both data that we collect ourselves from Reddit and 4chan and WikiLeaks and other places, and from other systems like the Internet Archive, TV Archive. And very importantly, we do a combination not only of quantitative analysis where we uh, take all this data and we apply fancy math to it or fancy layout algorithms to try to learn lessons from it, uh, but we use that data and those quantitative results as a roadmap for really deep qualitative dives to understand not just here's a pretty map, but what does it actually mean when you look at the content. Um, our first and, and one of our most important findings is about the architecture of the network. So this is a map of uh, the thousand most, oh, there's something down here that I'm kicking. Ah, there we go. <laughs> this is a map of the thousand most linked media sources during the election, uh, where each dot is a media source, and they're linked together by hyperlinks between the media sources. So uh, dots that are close to each other tend to link more to each other. Uh, they're colored by audience partisanship uh, that we determine by Twitter. So uh, basically the dark blue sites are sites that are tweeted overwhelmingly by people who also retweeted Hillary Clinton. The dark red sites are tweeted overwhelmingly only by people who also retweeted uh, Trump. And then the uh, pink, green, and light blue are various shades between. So this picture tells us some really interesting things. First, we see, a ver we see very little cinder right. So there's very little pink in this map. There's just dark red and then green, which is the center. So if you're reading on the right, you're reading far right. There's no sort of middle of the road right here. Uh, and also the right is very insulated. So we would expect to see sort of right on one side, left on, or red on one side, blue on the other side. Uh, but what we actually see is we see red all by itself. And then we see the, the dark blue, which is the far left, pretty tightly integrated with this mainstream media, which is still getting a lot of attention. Uh, we, what we call this is asymmetric polarization. Uh, so what this means is uh, the red is basically operating in its own media, media world, uh, the right, and the left is, is operating in a, in a media world that's tightly integrated with these mainstream institutions that have a, a deep commitment to their version of objective journalism, which is certainly problematic, uh, but also is also deeply felt and has real constraints on their behavior. On the right, the oldest site on the right there is uh, Fox News, which is 20 years old. And most of them are much newer. And the vast majority of them don't even pretend to obey any sort of forms of objective journalism. Oh. This is the same view, which is a little bit easier to, to read. This is just the top 100 sites. Uh, and again, you see the same thing. You just see the right uh, really isolated off on its own. And you see the, uh, the left pretty tightly integrated around this mainstream media, which is still the center of gravity. We, what we call this is the right versus the rest. Um, uh, we did the same thing for the first year of the Trump presidency. We see the same thing even more emphasized. So you see the right moving even further away after the election from the, from the center. Um, we tried the same thing using Twitter data. So this is the same idea. So these are media sources. But now the links are co-shares on Twitter. So we, we link two sites together if the same user shared the same story from two different sites on the same day. So uh, if two sites are close to each other on, on this map, then that means generally they tended, tended to be shared on Twitter by the same user. This is really remarkable. This is an entirely different data set, and it looks very similar 
uh, but even more dramatic than the previous map. So, that, so we're always very skeptical uh, as quantitative social scientists. We're worried that we're just getting some artifact from our own data or from the math. And this uh, is a pretty strong signal that, no, there's something actually happening underneath with the people reading the news. Sorry? Uh, the, the rotation means nothing. So the only thing that, me, the only meaningful, I'm, and I'm sorry this is fast, I'm happy to answer questions after the talk. The only meaningful information in this chart is how close the nodes are to one another and to some degree how close they are to the center. So the fact that Politico is right in the center there means that it tends to be the most um, evenly shared site from all the different sites. We literally, when I generate these, I just manually rotate them so the red is on the right for obvious reasons. <laughs> um, so uh, this, is, this is the map laid out exactly the same as the previous map. We just size these by Facebook nodes. What you'll see in the previous map and in this one is that uh, with the link map, Fox Nodes and Breitbart were about equally prevalent or influential in the, in the right. Uh, for uh, Twitter and Facebook, Breitbart gets more influential in, in Twitter and even more influential in Facebook. It's also true on the left, Huffington Post, for instance, the partisan sites in general become more influential in the social media um, sites. And finally, this is the same map we just saw. Oh, oh, sorry. So this is the post-election map of 2017 with just the top 100. And again, you see on Twitter just more and more separation between the sites even after the election happens. Uh, so very stark insulation of the right side. Uh, Breitbart and Fox re remain the... Um, the centers of gravity, even though you'll notice also when we look at Twitter, there are some really far hyperpartisan sites on the right that are quite important in that cluster, including uh, InfoWars and TruthFeed. So finally, this last chart that I'm going to show uh, is, uh, in my mind, maybe our most interesting finding. These charts show, let's start with the top one, that shows the number of hyperlinks uh, um, for number of hyperlinks leading to uh, each of the sites in each of these uh, partisanship quintiles. So on um, the blue or the left partisanship quintiles, the red is the right. What we see is even in the hyperlinks, uh, we see a pretty normal distribution on the left side going from far left to the other side of the center left. So we see this sort of typical bellish curve. Not exactly, but there's a distribution of how partisan they are even within the left and the center left or how, how much attention is paid. On the right, we see a, a, a very strong skew. So what this says is not only is the right insulated, but within that right, the vast majority of the hyperlinks are going to sites on the far right. So they're going to sites that almost are only view, uh, our, since our measure is, is by Twitter, they're going to sites that are almost only tweeted by very conservative users. The center chart is the same thing but by Twitter shares, and the bottom chart is the same thing but, but, but Facebook shares. And what we see is even more extreme. We see a little bit of skew on the left as we go down to Facebook, but we see really dramatic skew on the right. So with this, by the time we get to Facebook, almost the only thing people, uh, conservative site, almost the only um, sites that are being shared by conservative users on Facebook are the really, really conservative sites. And that's mostly because Fox and Breitbart and the other core influential sites are only virtually only viewed by the um, by conservatives. Thank you. Great. So if uh, technology gods are on my side, I can point with this thing. So uh, can you guys hear me? Wonderful. Uh, Great to be here. Uh, just to pile on this, this slide, one more thought on this is that this is what we mean when we say asymmetric polarization. There are clearly two sides, but the two sides are not the same. And the right is more insular, it's more extreme, it's more partisan. That's what this says here. This is different from that. And uh, that's not a subjective opinion, that's an empirical observation. And much of what we try to do in this book is to document that and understand uh, what it means and how it's reflected in different behavior. Uh, so what we did is we produced a model to help us think through this and understand different media systems. And this is a simple model based on media, public, and politicians. And the general idea is that politicians uh, tell the public what they want to hear. 
um, politicians want favorable coverage from the media. The public wants to understand what's going on in the world. They also have a preference for news that is confirming of their own worldview, which is self-reinforcing. In this view, it says reality check dynamic up there. It's cut off on the top. In a world in which media plays a role where they are actively seeking accuracy and objectivity, they put a check on this whole process. Politicians who go far, too far in saying things that the public wants to hear are held to account by media. And media doesn't always um, transfer happy news to the, to the public. Partisan media works differently. It's a fundamentally different animal. Under this circumstance, the various incentives of the players are the same, except that media, rather than seeking out accountability and seeking accuracy and objectivity, is, is working on producing partisan talking points and, and narratives. And what this does is this, in effect, um, weakens the um, checks against different information in the system. In some ways, it's a happier system. The politicians get to tell more happy, happy stories to the public. The public gets to hear more of what they like. And the relationship between the media and the politicians is a much friendlier one compared to the adversarial relationship we often see in the prior uh, model. Uh, these are different. And what this one enables is a very different tenor of narrative and dialogue. We still see conflict within a party and partisan media ecosystem, but the conflict is less about what is true and what is accurate. It's more about what the right narrative should be, and we see um, policing of the, of the narrative within this. This is a time at which Breitbart was going after Fox News during the primaries, trying to pull them farther to, uh, to the right. It also allows uh, info wars to be a part of this, uh, of this system. A key part to this is this is, a, this is a structural model, and it doesn't require or rely upon any personality traits, any differences in character or integrity or media savvy or media literacy or education. It's a model that's based upon um, the structures that are brought together, and Yokai will talk more about that, rather than the individual traits. We don't fundamentally believe that conservatives are more gullible than liberals. We believe they occupy different media ecosystems. And this by itself explains a lot of what we see. Uh, here's a quick um, case study to describe uh, what we're talking about. There's, uh, again, this is cut off, unfortunately, but there's, there's two media narratives that we tracked and document in the book. They're both salacious and um, designed to uh, produce disgust in readers. And it's about sexual allegations against Trump and the Clinton. The story of Trump was allegations uh, that he had raped a 13-year-old. Uh, the Clinton is all the different variations of, of pedophilia stories involving Bill and Hillary. Uh, what we see here is uh, the coverage of these stories, the Trump um, rape stories. On Facebook, you see a demand for that in Facebook. There's an audience that um, is sharing these stories and happy to do so. Same for the Clinton pedophilia stories. On Facebook, you see a nice appetite for these kinds of uh, salacious stories. As you move to Twitter, um, the appetite is still high here. Everything else is flat. And in the link economy, the more authoritative the, the view of the media systems based upon the uh, behavior of media sources themselves, um, you see nothing on the Trump rape story. And um, for us, the lesson from this is that um, the underlying um, demand for highly, highly partisan material is the same on the right and the left to some, to some degree. It's that demand is both there. There's something else at work here, and it's within the uh, structures of the media that are the difference. Uh, this is how the Trump rape story played out. It started with a story on the Huffington Post get, that was very, very popular. Um, other left-wing sites jumped into it, and what they did is they dug into the facts on the matter and they beat the story down. This is The Guardian, The Daily Beast, and Jezebel saying, there's not as much substance to this story. This is a red herring. Uh, the difference on right-wing media is everyone's singing in unison on the story. Uh, this story in Fox News right here, 
of all the Fox News stories in the entirety of the election, this was the story that was shared most frequently on Fox News. And the story didn't um, remain in online news. It also ended up on Fox News. It ended up on their flag flagship 6 p.m. Um, news program. Uh, Newt Gingrich weighed in on it, on, on Hannity as well. And so this, for us, describes the difference between the media ecosystems is less the supply of disinformation and hyperpartisan clickbait, but the mechanisms that either promote these stories and propagate them further or put a check on them. Uh, just a reminder here that Fox News is far and away the most popular source of information amongst conservatives and Trump, Trump voters. Uh, way above anyone else, Clinton voters, a mixed media diet. No matter how we look at the data and the sources of data that we look for, the ecosystem looks broadly the same. This is based on survey data by the Pew Research, so a completely different methodology than the work that we did and Hal showed in drawing together in links and Twitter views and Facebook views, but basically the same story. On the left, the the popular sources, and in the center, CNN, the major networks, you go out to the left, NPR, MSNBC are popular. On the right, it's Fox, it's Hannity, it's Limbaugh, it's Glenn Beck. These are different worlds. Uh, and in the background on this, uh, we've seen several decades of declining trust in media. Uh, back in the early 70s, uh, around 15% of the population said that they had hardly any uh, confidence in media, and that was fairly static across Republicans, Democrats, and independents. Over these past several decades, the, the number amongst Republicans has, has risen to 60%, and Democrats 40%. And there's the background. Yokai. <coughs> Okay, thanks. So I'm just going to uh, tease a couple of the additional things. Uh, at, uh, in the middle of the book, there are a lot of uh, rich case studies that are data guided, but give you a sense of how it works. Uh, so uh, 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 what I want to emphasize for purposes of now, happy to talk about things later. We also have a reception later. We'll be around. Any questions that you don't feel are answered here will be around. We're happy to talk. We're going to hang out. Um, so this is uh, the deep state. Uh, we show how uh, the framework of the deep state was very different before November 2016. It then shifts to being something about Obama holdovers going again, uh, going against uh, Trump and trying to bring him down instead of being about uh, a deep state in Turkey and Egypt and to some extent bipartisan criticism from libertarians and civil libertarians against the national security state. Critically here, notice the importance of Fox. What happens is for five years, there's a little bit of deep state. Then there's a massive spike when it's adopted by Fox News as a framework. We use a variety of different measures. So up there on, on the top right is a uh, um, uh, Google searches, tweets, uh, online links. Uh, and what you see is that as long as it's still in Breitbart and a little bit uh, uh, in the old framework of The Intercept, uh, it's relatively low. It spikes with the Flynn firing as Fox and Fox Business start to use this frame, and repeatedly, this is 15 second, uh, percentage of 15 second uh, segments on TV, uh, spikes consistently show an interference pattern where Fox and Fox Business are coming to the support, and then it replaces online and gets replicated. Similarly, Seth Rich, conspiracy that DNC staffer uh, was uh, uh, responsible for the DNC hacks, at the beginning, it looks very much like the story of online, crazy sites, uh, some alt-right uh, uh, alt -right Twitter handles, etc. But look at what happens and how different it is when Fox News jumps in in November of 2017. It completely, uh, I'm sorry, in May of 2015, which happens exactly when uh, Comey gets fired and Mueller gets um, uh, appointed. Um, similarly, we see and we have a detailed study on some really cool propaganda work that Breitbart did to force mainstream media to sort of talk about the Clinton Foundation right after the DNC, and that's one chapter. But in a later chapter, we show how the same story gets repurposed, not to be about Clinton Foundation, although it starts with it, but to get this business of Russia got 20% of U.S. nuke during Obama administration, and Hannity, thankfully, 
most often on YouTube as well, but obviously three million a night, uh, goes from Clinton kickback to the real Russia story are these guys who gave Russians 20% of uranium. So you see the repeated pattern across multiple case studies where when it's only online and not on Fox News, it's relatively small when you see there on the upper left-hand corner. When it's adopted for a month on TV, and again, we see here Fox Business and Fox News, it's more. Um, critically here, the pattern that Rob described comes from years, decades at this point, of sustained attack on mainstream media, on professional media in the right wing. Uh, Rush Limbaugh in 93 is already leader of the opposition. By 96, 37%, 18% are getting their news from Christian broadcasting and from talk radio. We go through a good bit of the media history and describe how changes in technology, changes in law and regulation, and changes in political culture all worked to reinforce each other in a long-term feedback effect to change the fundamental economics of the outrage industry. And the critical thing that distinguishes Rush Limbaugh and then Fox News from right-wing media from the end of World War II until 1988 is that the former was never a commercial success, whereas what happens is Rush Limbaugh proves a business model in the context of ubiquitous media, in this case AM, and then cable with Fox News, that becomes the first mover to shift things over from trying to share, get a share of the audience by programming to the middle and becoming a little better, to saying there's a large minority here that could be gotten by giving them exactly what they want, which is outrage. Once those people move, the, the center left and professional media start to give some interesting uh, reinforcement to the people on the other side because truth becomes partisan. Um, the earliest we have of our images is 2012. We already see a very similar structure because what happens is that by the time Breitbart in 2007 shows up, there's already an appreciable Fox News effect for 11 years. It's almost 20 years since uh, Limbaugh. The competitive pressures to actually gain attention are completely different than those faced by HuffPo, which starts a year before MSNBC even shifts to a uh, partisan model. And it never really takes off on the left, and we can talk about why uh, later. We don't want to understate the importance of Breitbart and the Breitbart-Trump uh, interaction. We have a full chapter on immigration and how Breitbart and Trump strengthened each other to make immigration the agenda of the election and frame it in Islamophobic terms. Uh, we don't want to understate the critical role of mainstream media. We're still talking only about 25 to 30% of the population who live inside the propaganda loop and only it. This picture of what people associated with Clinton in September of 2016 can only happen with the collaboration of traditional professional media. And what happened with traditional media, this is the prevalence of sentences related to Clinton and Trump, their scandals and their issues. And critically, what you see is that in the teeth of a highly asymmetric propaganda system, neutrality, practiced as neutrality between the parties rather than as objective pursuit of truth through accountable, transparent means of providing evidence, ends up being complicit in the asymmetric propaganda. We can talk Russians and why we don't think the Russians flipped the election, even though there's a lot of evidence, including in our data, that they're there and trying hard. We can talk fake news and commercial clickbait and why we think they only strove through the asymmetric system. Our basic point is not that the internet does not provide for a means for fringe groups to mobilize themselves, whether they're people we agree with and we think that it's deeply democratic. For many people here, it will be the movement for black lives whether we think it's abhorrent and something we should uh, uh, push, for many people here, that will be Unite the Right. There are affordances of self-organization for fringe groups to overcome the center. But critically, what we focus in this book is what transmits those 
to become population-wide beliefs. And here the thing that most surprised us and to us seems to be most contrary to the prevailing narrative of the moment is that it's professional mainstream media, both in its professional centrist model and in its highly commercially successful right-wing model is the scaffolding on which everything else is built. Martha, Claire, can you join us and uh, can we uh, hear uh, your thoughts? So first of all, everybody has to read this book. Um, it's incredibly powerful, and it's really the first rigorous empirical study that I know of, other than the article that you guys wrote that was already published, um, about what happened, uh, what happened uh, in the media, what happened with the elections. Um, I, I had a quick sneak peek, peek of the book, and I would summarize the contributions as five, uh, some of which you've heard. The first is that it's empirical and rigorous in terms of studying the patterns of media shares and media usage um, before the election after. Second is that I identifies this asymmetrical pattern, the different patterns for the right and the left. Um, the second, uh, third is that it, the argument of the book is that what's happened is not due to technology per se. It's not due to the architecture of the internet per se. Um, and, uh, and the fourth um, is that there is a, an interaction uh, with the business models and the economic motivations uh, that has a lot to do with what's developed. And the last one is that the underlying civic cultures matter. So there's a comparison that you didn't hear much about today with other countries that are dealing with very similar uh, situations, and yet there hasn't been the same kind of toxic feedback loop. So uh, these are all very compelling and persuasive to me, but I have a couple questions. So um, as to, it's not the technolo technology itself, it's hard to disagree with that, except for the business model question that surrounds the technology. So when Facebook, just as an example, had its public offering in 2012, there was a change in Facebook that suddenly the internal sources indicate Facebook had to find a way to monetize and it hadn't been doing that. And there was a ramp up to the engagement criterion, which is other, another word for rubbernecking how to get people to be so fascinated, outrage is another word, that they keep being engaged, keep being engaged, keep being engaged. And that's just grown and grown and grown since 2012, and that seems to coincide with your period, and that's just one of the players. So the, maybe it's not the architecture, but the business model connected to the architecture, um, which then affects not just the escalation of the shares, but also the news feeds and also then the advertising. I mean, it's all intertwined. So that's a question that I ask. Maybe it's not the technology itself, but what's the, what about the interaction between the technology and the business models? And we know that the biggest employers right now of behavioral scientists are the tech companies that are you know, programming to make sure that we can't let these machines out of our hands. Um, another question that I have um, is, on the issue of business model discussion, the fight for attention uh, has a dimension here with the explosion of many, many different devices and media. And so the transition from mainstream trying to get the middle to narrow casting, I'd like to understand more about that because some people said that that happened with cable to begin with. Um, I'd like to understand how that interacts with uh, internet and social media, particularly. Um, and on the topic of the underlying civic cultures matter, again, I don't know if it's causation or correlation, but the same period of time that's tracked here, particularly about the rising distrust of media, there's very similar patterns about the declining faith in democracy in America. I mean, just as like just the perfect and so I don't know what's cause and effect, but there's something else going on here um, besides uh, simply the focus on the media. 
Um, and maybe they're related and maybe they're not. Just then, finally, a few random thoughts. I don't know what to make of the polls that say that NPR is the most trusted source. I, I, I just, it is, it regularly comes out that way. I disclose I'm on the board of public broadcasting uh, here in Boston, but maybe we just kid ourselves. But it's, there it is. Um, another uh, is that the, um, the interactions between Fox and Breitbart and Trump are so important before the election and after the election that we know that P staffers in the White House try to get a message on Fox so that the president will see it. So to try to understand you know, how that works really as an organ, both of the Trump administration, but also frankly, the internal communication system of the Trump administration uh, since the election, um, I think that that's an, uh, at least a question or something to observe. Um, and, uh, and then finally, um, I do think it was very striking in looking at the structural uh, map, Rob, about the feedback loop, the centrality of identity, the centrality of identity. Now, political scientists tell us a lot about the centrality of identity in politics in the 20th century and now the 21st, but I think that's another factor to explore, and that's a change in democratic politics. So those are my reactions. Claire. Um, so, so I'll be brief, because um, I, I just want us to have a discussion. Um, I haven't had a chance to read the book yet, but I mean, there are at least three slides that I wanted to come up and cuddle. I mean, the slide about mixed methods. I mean, if we have to watch another study that's just Twitter data, and the fact that it combines social media data with television and other things, yeah. I, just, I just want this to be the baseline yeah. for every country in the world to recognize, can we start <coughs> having proper conversations about it? The last two years have been a number of governments having exercises where they ask for evidence so that they can think about regulation. We shouldn't be going anywhere near regulation when we've got such a tiny amount of empirical research on this topic. And, you know, I'm sure people will read this and there will be flaws like there are with every study, but what you've attempted to do, which is to actually look at the whole ecosystem and put it in historical perspective. So the slide with the timeline, I definitely wanted to cuddle that. I mean, how can we really understand how we've got to this space? So um, I think it's incredible for those reasons. And um, I work at the Shorenstein Center and we're currently, we have a lab where we're monitoring a lot of those spaces. So we spend a lot of time on 4chan and 8chan and Discord and we see a lot of the tactics and techniques being played out. And what we see is disinformation agents in those spaces attempting to manipulate the mainstream media, attempting to manipulate journalists and the platforms, knowing that journalists are looking at what's trending, what hashtag is doing well as story ideas. We see that play out every day in, it's not the dark web, it's actually spaces that you don't really want to go because people are anonymous and it's pretty nasty, but they're in these spaces talking through what you've shown us in those graphs. And so I think in order for us to understand this complexity and to think about solutions, it's exactly what you're saying. And, and to your point too, um, the identity piece. You know, for the last two years, I just keep saying in rooms like this, as academics and journalists, we like to think that people have a rational relationship to information. It is 100% emotional. And it's 100% about identity, 100% about worldview. Social media is about performance. We are making performative decisions every time we decide to share something. And I think if we don't understand that space, um, we're in trouble. And, and that came out so beautifully as well in, in what you're trying to say. Um, so I would lastly say is we're also working across the world. We're currently working in Brazil on the Brazilian election. We see similar issues there around polarization. I've just come back from Europe where we like to pride ourselves on public service broadcasting and what that means and how this won't happen in Europe. Every person I talk to is just saying, we're three years behind America, aren't we? And I think us not understanding what that looks like, but l not learning the lessons. And the EU parliamentary elections are happening in May and seeing what's happening in Hungary and Poland and seeing similar forces at play and seeing the role of television, RT and Sputnik, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it becomes no less terrifying. I'm so excited this book has come out, but it's 2018. We're about four weeks away from the midterms. We're not, we haven't really done anything in the last two years. We're not really prepared at all for what's about to happen globally as well as in the US and as I say often when I sit on these chairs is how do we take this to a place where we're actually making change happen and Yoko at the end when you were saying you know who I blame is the journalists I was like <laughs> so I spent a lot of time with journalists I said? <laughs> but but going back to that emotion piece yeah. um so 
uh, in July, we ran a conference uh, at Harvard, and we had 70 of the biggest newsrooms in the country, and we mapped out their Facebook page numbers on a graph. BBC were in the room, they have 45 million Facebook likes. So they're at the top of the graph, it goes down, and everybody felt very good about themselves with their huge Facebook followings. We then did the same for the top 70 junk news sites, which nobody in this room thinks anybody looks at. We plotted on the same graph, we put them next door to each other, it's green, red, green, red, green, red, green, red, green, red. Those junk new sites are getting just as much traffic yeah. as those sites, and this is exactly what you've played out. They're two different worlds. There is a reason that those junk new sites that don't have to sign up to editorial policy guidelines, that don't have corrections policies, that don't have ethics training, that have legal training, and they use emotion. They use emotion in their headlines and their visuals every single day, it is asymmetrical, not just in the ecosystem, but in terms of the rules of the game. And so I agree with you, if we had NPR journalists in here and BBC journalists in here, I don't know how we really talk about how they would have to shift their work to really play in this space. And I'll leave with this story, which was about six months ago, I was on a panel with somebody from the State Department. And we did a project around the French election, and they did a project, because it was the, the American State Department. And I said, so do you take out micro-targeted ads to Russians in St. Petersburg about how great America is? And he said, yeah, yeah, we, we pay for dark ads. And I was like, well, isn't that what we complain about? But, no, but we have pre-roll that says, sponsored by the State Department. <laughs> And what I realized at that point is it is asymmetrical on every single level, both <laughs> journalism, the ecosystem, and our foreign policy. So that's a depressing place to end, but everything, yes, yes, yes. Does either one of you want to pick up any of this rich set of comments? Uh, there's so much there to do. I just wanted to pick up on one thing that Martha said about um, Facebook and media models. And I think what we've seen is an experiment in what purely demand side me journalism looks like, and it's really ugly. Um, and when we see good journalism and we see people holding to the truth, there's institutions that are intermediaries involved. And I'm not sure how we build that into that system. So we have, um, we're very fortunate to have the legacy of the existing media ecosystem and the norms and the standards that they follow still in existence uh, that many, many people pay attention to. But I don't know how we hold on to that, and that's something that keeps me up at night. But even if we, I mean, every morning there are 20 news stories about Trump's tweets because the newsrooms think that they still live in an ecosystem where people go to their brand. In an algorithmic system, the algorithm will only ever serve you one or two stories about Trump's tweets because they know that that's not going to work. So really, we need to tear everything up, start again, because by following that, we're not covering the absence of the judiciary, the fact that the yeah. state appointments have been you know, disbanded, the fact that we're not talking about how the family is making money because the ethics have gone out of the window. So, But that requires us to completely rethink what we're doing, but in Instead, we're taking the same rules, at, which is making money, but you can't make money in an algorithm system where duplication does not get rewarded. Yep. Martha? Well, when the legacy media is deciding who gets promoted and who gets a bonus based on how many hits they get, everybody's in the same game. Yep. The legacy media is not playing a different game in just to continue the depressing point, people who cover the Supreme Court for legacy media are judged by how quickly they get their story up and then how many hits. And I don't know about you, but last time I read a Supreme Court opinion, it took a while. So th there's a distortion, profound distortion about even the legacy media. What I wanted to say though was about Facebook, um, just specifically, there, there's a two-part documentary uh, upcoming on Frontline on the 29th and 30th of this month. Um, I recommend it. Um, Sheryl Sandberg, when she was hired to be the grown-up and create the business model, uh, she said, she said, we're not a news organization. We're not journalists. And I know they're having an identity crisis right now because they now have heard enough of, and they've done their own internal metrics to see how much they are a news source. And you know, what are they gonna do? Because they like the money and they like the, they, they like the money and I don't think they're gonna change. So let me push back a little bit uh, on both of those claims about Facebook. Um, We've had this discussion before. <laughs> and hopefully we'll continue it often uh, and, 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 and repeatedly. Um, we actually were really surprised 
by how central um, the large traditional media outlets were by all of these measures. Uh, and when we combine, and that's true both in terms of what sites link to, which we take as a, essentially an image of supply, the decisions by media producers to link to each other and give authority and credence and get credence, uh, and also by Twitter, which we see as an image of the supply, essentially what people are attending to. Um, <clears throat> and so first of all, uh, this finding that even on Facebook, the most attention is by traditional media, uh, pushes back against this. A little bit when we focus on the distribution, uh, what you see is that a lot of these engagement with uh, the crazy sites on Facebook, Claire, that you emphasize, is high engagement by a relatively narrower base of unique users. Uh, and work that is gradually coming out that's more empirical about Facebook suggests that it's a particular demographic. Our work particularly seems to say that in the US, again, in the US, it has a very clear um, 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 baseline difference in, 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 in who is doing it. Um, and uh, uh, my sense is that Facebook and, and the survey data that suggests that uh, there is a small minority that sees social media as their main source. There is a, um, um, a, a, a larger minority that uses social media a lot mm -hmm. for news. Uh, but most people, there's a reason. Why do they say NPR? Presumably actually because radio still continues to be the thing that most people actually consume. They just don't think about it because they're commuting or they're doing whatever they're doing. Uh, so, so I, I'm a little worried that in the, con so, so not a little worried. I read our data as suggesting absolutely the internet, social media generally, Facebook are uh, wrapping themselves around what we're already doing and projecting forward. But what's happening today is still very much anchored in mainstream media. Uh, and, and I worry that when, you, when we overstate uh, now, I agree with you about the, 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 the incentives, and I think we need completely different regulation of advertising and how it's used on Facebook, because that's the problem of the next decade. Yeah. Uh, and maybe in that regard, we got lucky. But that's, that's the way in which I see our data is pushing back sure. Sure. a little bit. I think it's fair, fair statement, um, but I'm just projecting out because it's the advertising, uh, advertising data, data that is now hollowed out for the legacy media. And while it's great to see the bump of interest in the Washington Post and the New York Times, we have newspapers and legacy media closing down everywhere else in the country and news deserts all over and local news in particular is a catastrophe. Um, so it, it's just projecting out. So uh, what I would add to this is one way that I read our results is we are at the end or at the beginning of a new uh, um, stage of this progressive revolution that happened 100 years ago where Harvard as it exists now was created over a course of you know about 40 years, journalism, medicine, all of our modern institutions of truth were basically created you know, between 1900 and 1950 and were highly trusted until sometime around you know, 1990. Uh, and then um, something happened. Um, one way of viewing that movement is in the 1900s, the world got really big and we had to start to make sense of it beyond our town. We had to make sense of the world, this crazy world across many towns and cities. Uh, what we've seen across all of these technologies, whether it's AM radio or cable TV or Facebook or Twitter, is that they encourage, uh, they encourage their own versions of clickbait. Mm -hmm. um, but they're all technologies that happen within some uh, political institutional context. Uh, and the most surprising part of our findings are that on the liberal side, we have a sort of successful, in some ways, indication of how this can work. You can have Addicting Info and HuffPost and New York Times working together to moderate each other in a relatively healthy way. And that's not all of those sites and mechanisms have their own very large, very difficult problems we have to solve. Uh, 
but there's some sense of seeking toward the, their own versions of the truth. Uh, but what our data clearly show is there's another political context that's happening on the right that's just veering way off. Um, and that says to me that the problem, if the problem is technology and we can just say, let's just figure out the technology, let's just go to Facebook and convince them to be responsible, that is hard but seems solvable. If the problem is 40% or 25% of our country is just fundamentally doesn't feel invested in this progressive world that we've built and doesn't believe in any of these institutions of trust, that's a lot harder. So we are, uh, uh, we are going to end, not the conversation, but this session at 6.30 and go downstairs uh, to have it in a more relaxed form. So we have time for maybe one or two uh, comments, questions. Um, I wanted to pick up on the question about mixed methods and also to push you a bit more on whether you have a theory about the extent to which online activity influences and informs political views and outcomes compared to offline communication sources. And I wanted to clarify, when you refer to traditional media or legacy media in your data, are you looking at, say, for instance, CNN, are you only looking at online content that's CNN, or are you also looking at viewing CNN on TV, and if so, what was your media consumption data for the offline mainstream media um, analysis? Uh, so, we only look at TV on the case studies. We don't have access to it on the larger scale. It's all uh, the, the larger scale images, the big find, is more based on other people's surveys and on our detailed observation online. We do use the TV archive to do text search and then uh, guided research for purpose of looking at TV uh, uh, across the major uh, channels for the specific case studies. Um, we don't have, when you say offline, you mean activism on the street or you mean TV? Watching TV. Uh, so have we made judgments about impact in the world of online and TV? Um, no, I don't think so. Did we do that anyway? No. Well, I mean, we don't have, we, there's a gap, right? So we can look, we can look at our own, at our web data, we, or even Twitter data, we, we have very good metrics about exactly what people are doing with that yeah. content. Uh, we can look at survey data to get a sense of what people are viewing in their cars or while they're you know, making dinner. We, uh, we are very aware of and always questing, but it's very hard to, to fill that last gap where we try to understand, right, what is the actual impact? We've done this in some of our previous work. You can do sort of forensic work where you can talk to people. So we, we wrote a paper on network neutrality and we can actually call people and we you can talk senator, senators or aides and say, hey, you seem to make this decision at this point. Why did you make this decision? But that's, that's a gap that we're aware of and always trying to close, but it's really, really hard. Thank you for this. My name is Marcy Murningham. I've been around here for a long time. In, ten, uh, in 2010, the Kennedy School published a report that my co-author Bill Bowie and I wrote about corporate uh, accountability with the rise of social media. And it was published by the Center for Business and Government. And when we did our research then, we were asking people in companies as well as advocacy groups about Facebook and Twitter, and virtually nobody knew much about either one. So that was only eight years ago, and it's really remarkable to think about where we are now in this turbocharged system. Uh, Ithiel de Sola Poole wrote a book called Technologies of Freedom, and I wonder, if I, there are sort of two questions here in what I, I'm, I'm putting forward. One is that some of what is going on right now could be explained by the inevitable lag between what was then and what is now, what was the, the current reality 
uh, is very different than our regulatory and economic systems. So the point that Martha was making about CEOs and others are judged on the basis of clicks is an old business model that has yet to fully adapt to the, to the new reality, just as the regulatory system exists for yesterday's media environment. So I wonder what that, those charts will look like in a few years as we catch up with that on the lag side. The second point is, and this was part of, certainly, it's certainly my life's work, but it's part of what you touched on earlier. Maybe it's also true in terms of the erosion of civic culture that profound power shifts affecting the economy and politics have left a lot of people feeling uh, voiceless and without any agency. And that kind of alienation is toxic, as we've seen. It's a ripe uh, organizing field for terrorism, for, for authoritarianism, and all of that, all the emotional appeals to uh, the game is rigged and you're doing the right thing and it's their problem. How do we do that? How do we address or start to reweave the body, uh, the political and civic fabric, or heal the body politic in a way that discernment can be uh, more present and what people see locally uh, as they participate in these global systems at least ground them in some sense of truth and agency where their voices are heard. Thanks. Martha, this may actually, no. <laughs> no. Um, so this also brings back a point that Martha, you had put earlier on the table and that I think um, uh, we never got to, which is the which is the question of of um, what's the relationship between politics, between the construction of identity, and uh, and the long term declining trust in institutions, uh, and what we're observing today, and uh, part of what we try to do in the chapter on the origins of asymmetry. Uh, is connect the emergence of uh, religious identity uh, as a pillar of the Republican Party uh, and how it connects to the rise of Christian broadcasting as a critically identity-based pillar. The strategy of the Nixon campaign and thereafter of reshuffling the parties around the Southern strategy with white identity politics at its core, and the change in the alliance that made the Republican Party and that was part of the reshuffling of North and South around Democrat-Republican, uh, had a lot to do with why it is that these media, uh, these changes in the technology and the regulation found a ready audience. Uh, and so that's a story that we tell about how identity uh, gets used for politically strategic purposes and then creates the audience onto which then the business model is able to build itself. Uh, and I think that's critically important. Um, and the question of distinguishing the role of media as opposed to background culture and the decline of trust in institutions, I suspect you have at least as much, if not more, than us basically on this, uh, based on this, to look at the various dimensions of it. Uh, but again, we have this dual effect. Rush Limbaugh has been talking about the four corners of deceit for decades. Government, academia, science, and the media. So there's a component of that. But there's also a component on the left of critique of objectivity, critique of authority, uh, 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 what on earth does this mean against the man. Uh, all of this, these together play out with just a deep raising of the baseline. So I think what we see when we look at the data on how many people have almost no trust in media is a combination, I think, of this background uh, shift away from accepting authority towards being generally more skeptical about authority. The deviation between the two is likely, at least in part, a component of the realignment of identity politics in America and the feedback effect with media that propagandizes to this community uh, even more. But that's a guess at a very broad level. Um, 
we should go have fun. Thank you both so much, Martha and Claire, for coming and spending your time with us. Thank you. And thank you all for coming and spending time with us. We're going to hang around and talk uh, as long as you want to talk within limits. <laughs>